The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Coming up, Beth Moore explores how to discern relationships. I'm never trusting anybody again because I would have thought if I could have trusted anybody, it would have been that particular person. In Psalm 116, 11, it says, In my dismay, I said, all men are liars. Some of you are going, that is my new life verse right there. <laughs> Spiritual discernment, next on Life Today. joining us on Life Today and also Wednesdays with Beth. I'm Betty Robinson and this is James. And it is always a joy to present Beth. She is completing a series on spiritual discernment. and God knows we need it. It's amazing how it seems that people do not have the ability to discern the times. They don't seem to be able to discern the spirit. And uh, if there is an obvious element missing too often throughout the world and here in our own country, it seems to be wisdom, understanding, and uh, Beth is going to help. As a matter of fact, you're going to hear how easily you can be swept off your feet or manipulated or deceived by deceiving spirits if you don't discern and uh, how you really do need to live uh, with your eyes wide open, not wide shut. Here's Beth Moore. Welcome, Mark. Now, this is what happens. Of the two to four, we talked about one could be run. All right, if he doesn't tell us to run, it's going to fall between the two, three, and four category. This is when we're still called to hang around, but we're already discerning that something is wrong. Can anybody besides me say you've been in that situation where, you know, it's God's will for you to stay? God's will for you to stay perhaps in that friendship. God's will for you to stay in that um, mentoring relationship. God's will for you to stay in that particular um, a group of people, but you know that it can't be as you were. It's got to be a new way because now you spiritually discern that something is up. Uh, what's it going to be? First one's run. Okay, if he hasn't told us to run, it's got to be one of, of the following, two, uh, three, or four. And the second one is this, take a step back. Take a step back. If he doesn't say run, but you are discerning that something is not what it seems and you are getting a warning in your spirit, something down in here that's not about feelings, it's beyond emotion. It's, you can't shake it. I need to know if anybody has ever been there besides me where you say, I can't, I'm telling you, I want to. Have you ever just like prayed your head off before you got with somebody because when you got with them, you, you go away thinking, okay, something seems wrong and I don't want to think that. Something's not what it seems. You just keep begging God, make it be what it seems. But it's discernment. Something's up. All right, take a step back. Now, perhaps it may be physically. In other words, uh, maybe we just back off from the relationship a little bit. If it's not physically, it definitely needs to be emotionally. Definitely. If you've already discerned something is up, uh, things are not what they seem. Listen, God's word tells us that above all in Proverbs 4.23, we are to guard our hearts for from it flows the wellsprings of life. Now, we've got to guard our hearts. And if you realize that something is dangerous, something is off, something is not what it seems, you've asked yourself those four questions and you keep getting no's to them. And yes, you are on to something here. God has not released you. He's not said run. Okay, well then, I may be still in this situation, but I am going to put a little bit of emotional distance. I'm going to know something cannot be trusted here. Maybe not someone, but the enemy is somehow at work here in a way that I need to scoot back from it. That will also help us see clearer because we've got some of the emotion out of it. Pull back some. I have a, a family member in my family of origin that I began to realize just is a dangerous person emotionally. I mean, like, she, she could have you questioning 
every bit of value you had by the time she was finished with you if she was in a mood to, very, very punishing. And, and I knew I couldn't just dismiss the relationship. It was too key. But I knew I was going to have to be different in the relationship. And I knew I was going to have to make a decision that although I did not happen to put, it was not God's um, desire for me to run. It was also not God's desire. It was not the situation where I could put physical distance between us. So what I did was I would be just as close as could be. I might be touching distance. I might be holding hands distance. But my heart was pulled back, not removed, just pulled back where I could have some sanity and think some clear thoughts in the spirit. Uh, number three is this, ask questions. Ask questions of the person. If you're in a group, ask questions of the group. If, it's just, if the, you happen to be in an accountability group that you're thinking, okay, something is off here, a Bible study group here, just a, a, a group of, of, of friends that you're thinking, okay, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know what's up here, but I feel something and I cannot shake it and I've prayed it through and I've prayed it through and I've asked to have love that is knowledgeable and, and has insight and has some discernment. I still can't shake it. Ask some key questions. I mean, just like talk to the person. Here's what I want to say, and this one is extremely important under the same number three. Do it face to face. Do it face to face. If you need to... Um, Talk to somebody because there are some things that are not adding up to you. And there are some things that just don't, uh, somehow you just still feel a warning somehow deep in your, uh, in your spirit. Uh, don't just talk on the phone. Go with them face to face. Because let me tell you something, it's a whole lot harder to lie to somebody's face than it is to lie in an email, in, in a text, uh, on the telephone. You want to be face to face. Because when you're talking to someone dead on, you're looking straight in their eyes and they're looking straight in yours and you ask some questions, you know, like, I, I wanted to go back over this. I, listen, I, I'm not, I, 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 I really want to hear your story and I really want to understand that, but I'm just, I'm just wondering about this. And if they cannot look at you, something is wrong. You can tell. There's so many things we can tell from nonverbal communication, but get face to face. Sometimes we know somebody looked us straight dead on in the eye and told us what we were so hoping we would hear. That means that we were either wrong about it or they're a psychopath. You know, that, that can happen too. But it, it needs to be face to face. Uh, put your scripture down, Ephesians 4, 15. This is what the scripture would tell us to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. If, if your relationship cannot survive you speaking the truth in love, you probably don't need to be in it. And I probably don't need to be in it. If I keep feeling like something is wrong here, something is up, I, everything in me is flagging in this situation. If I cannot go and speak the truth and love, you're thinking, listen, this is not just somebody, this is not someone I could do that with. Something is wrong. And it may be a relationship that needs to be redefined. Resituated in such a way that we're not so emotionally involved. If the answers don't add up, Ask God if you are to lovingly confront. That's what we've got to do. Number four is this. Okay, say he's not done. He's told us to stay right where we are. We have spoken the truth in love. We still are fairly certain things are not what they seem. But God has called us right there. Number four, if that's what he's done, number four is this. Love with your eyes wide open. Love with your eyes wide open. I am saying in spiritual terms here, do not even blink. Is that speaking to anybody? There are times when you and I are called to love extremely unhealthy people just like they have loved us in our same estate. We need some people to stick it out with us, don't we? Uh, we, we need some people to speak the truth and love to us. We've had people that have worked with us long enough uh, to see us come to, to some substantial wholeness and those relationships are precious to us. We want to give those chances to people. But let me tell you something, we don't even need to blink. We ought to set us some boundaries there where, where we know, where we can think straight, where our hearts are... are um, activated with knowledge and insight so that we can discern what is best. And if nothing changes, then just stay open to God's signal to release. If you don't get it, you just hang in there. But listen, don't lie with them. 
After a while, by the time I've asked some questions, after a while, when I know they are flat out not going to stop, this is going to still continue to be deceptive, and you're knowing better than this. You're knowing this is not straight up. Then somewhere down the line, I have got to be able to say, this is not, something's not right here, and I, I need you to just help me with, with, with what? And, and if they can't do that, then I'm going to look for God's release. Run. Take a step back. Ask questions. Or if you're told to stay right there next to him, you love with your eyes wide open. Now, let me, let me say this to you because I think this is so important. We might get down the road in a relationship and nothing ever came of it. In other words, we just were like, something is wrong here in this situation. I'm not judging that person's heart, but something just, I am getting a warning in my spirit. Something does not seem, maybe you get down the road and you never did know what it was. Maybe you were in just a, a momentary um, uh, uh, encounter and you walked away thinking, okay, I think something is up there, but nothing ever came of it. You never knew what it was. Let, let me tell you something. When you and I act as best we can based on spiritual discernment, on the leadership of the Spirit, we, this is going to be the tricky part of it. We may not always be right, but we did not sin. Can, can somebody stay with me there? Because here's what happens. The reason why so many of us think, you know, I don't have any right to do this anymore because I already blew it. I've, I've already blown it several times. I mean, I thought that about that person. It didn't turn out to be that way at all. And so I don't know what in the world I'm thinking here. But, uh, well, you might not be wrong this time. You might not. But when, when you and I, as best we know how, try to walk in the Spirit, and maybe we end up being wrong about something. We may have been wrong but we weren't in blatant sin. We were trying to do the will of God. We were trying to... If we missed it, we may have made a mistake, but we did not commit a sin. So did it humble us? Well, that's okay too. I want you to write down an address. It would take us all day long to find the scripture. So I just want you to write it down, Obadiah 1.3. <laughs> Now you know why I'm going to tell it to you. Obadiah 1.3 says something very important. The pride of your heart has deceived you. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Listen, we want to be humble people because if we're proud in a situation, if we're full of ourselves in a situation, uh, remember, we're just operating like mere men or women then. And the pride of our hearts will deceive us. If there's pride and arrogance involved, we cannot trust what we think we're sensing because we've got too much of ourself mixed up in the mess and we're too entangled in it to see the truth. Obadiah 1.3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Sometimes um, we're too proud to take the chance of being proved wrong. So in spite of it, we just continue on and end up woefully sorry. Woefully sorry. Woefully sorry. I want to say one other verse to you as well before we draw this thing to a close. If we get punked, and we've already said from the beginning when we took a, just a little show of hands just in this audience, how many of us knew we had been punked somewhere along the way? If we get punked, we got to try our hardest not to get cynical because it's really easy after that point to think, you know what, I'm never believing anybody again. I'm never trusting anybody again. Because I would have thought if I could have trusted anybody, it would have been that particular person. I want to remind you of something the psalmist said in Psalm 116.11. In Psalm 116.11, it says, In my dismay, I said, all men are liars. Some of you are going, that is my new life verse right there. <laughs> the fact is, all men are not liars, nor are all women liars. But we can decide, we can have been lied to on such a big occasion in such a deep relationship that we decide, you know what, everybody lies. Nobody can be trusted. Don't get cynical. Don't get so, so you've been punked. Okay, well, let's just be humbled by it. But let's go back after it. Go, Lord, teach me better than this. I know better than this. Make me smarter than I am. Help me to know what I can't know understand what in human terms I could not possibly understand. 
Because one thing is for sure, whether or not somebody's a poser, they need prayer. We've all been posers at one time or another. That's why he brings trials to prove our faith genuine. I want to tell you a little silly something as we close here. I hope this will be a story that you can appreciate. If not, it will get cut out and edited anyway, and you'll never know what happened. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, we're not lying, especially if we're just grandparents or parents. Sometimes we're just telling a little fairy tale. Now, I'm very, very close to my, my grandson, Jackson, and he is at our house uh, often, sometimes spends the night and has a slumber party with us. And I just love it because I may not get any sleep because when I say that he wants to sleep with me, what I mean is really like on my person. <laughs> and many of you may know how that is. And we sleep, you know, like right in the middle of the bed together. And, and he invariably, the moment, the moment that there is any light in the room, he is wide-eyed and open and staring. I can feel his little breath on my face just like that. He goes, Bibby? He says, is it time for Mr. Sun? Because we just always love to get up in the morning and twist open the mini blinds, and we both say together all at the same time, good morning, Mr. Sun. So I just, I love doing that with Jackson. And at night, every time I carry him out to the car after we've kept him in the evening, he did this just this week. Take him out to the car and he looks up and he goes, there's Mr. Moon. Mr. Sun has gone to sleep. Mr. Moon is up. And we just, and you know, I know there's not really a Mr. Sun and a Mr. Moon, but it's a wonderful thing you do with grandchildren. And so he asked his daddy, he said to my wonderful son-in-law, Curtis, daddy, is Mr. Sun a man or a girl? And so Curtis looked at him because, you know, he's got this mother-in-law and it's, you know, like I'm sappy about everything. I, I mean, I put the cheese in Velveeta, you know, I'm just like, and he says to him, son, Mr. Son is not a man or a girl. It's just gas. It's just <laughs> gas. <laughs> and so I said, well, that proves it. It's a man. We'll see if that stays. <laughs> Some things are just fairy tales. Others are just big, fat lies. You and me are on this planet during the age of the poser. Let it not be us. These are days for spiritual discernment. To obtain information on Beth's teaching materials and for her speaking schedule, visit us online at lifetoday.org. Well, Beth, you kind of went from just a little, <laughs> a little smile on our faces to a, a very serious, a serious point to close a very, very important message. I, uh, I really want you to understand the importance of what Beth has emphasized so effectively, and that is spiritual discernment. Father, I pray for every viewer that they would realize that they have an anointing, the Holy Spirit, who can teach them. And the Holy Spirit that Jesus said he was sending, another of the same kind, to guide us to truth, to give us the ability to discern the times and the spirits. So I pray, dear God, you will grant to every person who opens and yields their life to your will, the spirit of discernment. In Jesus' name. You know, one of the things that has blessed me and Betty as much perhaps as any message that is communicated to us is the appreciation level that you express for what God has called us to do when it comes to reaching out and touching the suffering and doing it in a way that's effective and doing it because of love. And uh, you, you've let us know that there's a tremendous joy and a sense of fulfillment when you participate. Well, we are doing something right now that's exciting. As a matter of fact, people have told us that it's one of the great joys of their life. We've had some people tell us, you know, we've, we've experienced this year some tough challenges and it's been difficult for us to do some of the things you've asked. And we've even had a few people, Betty, say we've been able to drill a water well and this year we can't. Mm -hmm. And you never know how much that hurts us. And they said, we're praying God will raise up somebody else that will or several people that will. Well, you know, when you see the, the need and you recognize the opportunity that we've been given to legitimately and effectively meet a need, 
I think you're going to want to participate. I want you to watch with your eyes, but I want you to discern in the spirit. Is that a need that needs to be met and I can meet it? Watch closely. And that little girl a moment ago, beautiful eyes, and, and turn that little cup up. Precious. All the little children are precious in the eyes of God. And then you hear a teacher. Jesus was a great teacher. You hear a teacher pleading the cause and the need of those children. What, what do you sense in your heart? Because I know many viewers would certainly identify. Well, the fact that the teacher realizes and knows that every time she offers a cup of water to any one of those children, she's opening their little bodies up to possible diseases from that water, the contamination of it. And that must break her heart because she, she's there because she cares about the children, teaching them and loving on them. And so that, that really touches me, James, that there as, as an individual, her heart goes out to those children. And I feel that when I watch them. I think, well, why, why do you give that water to them? That's all they have. We have to have water for our bodies. So regardless of what she knows that that can do to her, her precious little students there, she has to give it to them. Can, can you imagine the heartache when you hear a child say, I'm thirsty, and then you know you need to give them water, but you also know I'm giving them something that could likely make them sick and I have seen it actually take their lives. And the thing is that that teacher is hoping and expressing her heart desire, but you and I together, you the viewers, joining with us and the missionaries that see the need, we can be an answer to that, that appeal for those children. We can put a fresh water well right there. You know, Betty, we've had so many people over the years tell us this is the greatest joy they experience. This year, because we feel the economic pinch has felt around the world. I don't care if you're in Australia or the United Kingdom or Canada or here in the U.S. We felt it. We've had a number of people say, you know, we're not, we're not going to be able to do what we normally do. And boy, it breaks my heart. But I think about that, that prayer request, that need, that, that heart cry of that teacher and so many missionaries and so many children. And you may have heard me recently, I've said, I prayed God would raise up a hundred people in a single day. They said, I can give a well. You know, that'd really be a miracle. But that miracle can only happen one at a time. We say, I can do it. We can do it as a couple. And, and the prayer can be answered if every person watching, yes, you, would just do something to provide the water. Let me give you an example. $48, the wells are $4,800. That's what it costs. That's the average cost. Some a little more, some a little less, but that's the average. $48, 10 people water the rest of their life. That's how it breaks out. $144, 30 people. Could you give that 144? Could you give the 48 and pray others will join until we have another well? That's how we get most wells. But I'm praying that God will touch your heart and you'll say, okay, I will do my part sharing the heart of God, being an answer to that teacher's plea. We want to send you a book, Believe This, Not That. It'll bless you. We want to send you the Water for Life coffee mugs. It'll remind you to pray for people who need water. And we'd love to send you the Lion and the Lamb Bronze, a beautiful collectible. You can tell your friends, I help give water to the desperately thirsty. 
And it oftentimes inspires others to say, how can I help? And many times they do. Would you go to the phone right now, take your bank card, use it like a check? Would you do that, please? Or write a check, make it to life, but call us and tell us you're mailing it? You can, if you like, go online, lifetoday.org, and make your gift. Thank you for doing that. Please do it now, and may God direct you in what you give. Every day, millions of children are forced to make a dreadful choice, drink filthy, polluted water filled with deadly disease, or die from thirst. No child should ever be faced with this decision. The good news is that there is a solution. Mission Water for Life is one of the most exciting and viable demonstrations of God's love in the world today. Suffering can end because clean water changes everything. With your gift today, we will begin drilling 350 new water wells for remote villages in 12 different nations. Your gift of $24 will help provide clean water for five people. A gift of $48 will help provide for 10 people. $72 will impact 15 people. And $144 will help provide fresh, clean, disease-free water for 30 people for a lifetime. With your gift, be sure to request Believe This, Not That, a brand new topical Bible promise book that will encourage you in every area of life. With your gift of $100 or more, you may request our newly released Water for Life mug set, a daily reminder of the clean water you make possible to those who thirst. Also, please prayerfully consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well. And be sure to request the 2012 commemorative bronze sculpture, The Lamb and the Lion. Please call, write, or make your secure gift online today. You know, Beth talked about discernment. This book is a book that will help your increase in discernment. Believe this, a promise from heaven for every need, really every question and challenge on earth. Believe this, not that, not what the enemy says. You talk about getting your discernment, anten your discernment antennas up, your sensitivity level increased, this will help. Thank you for helping us share water. Praying that others will join. Thank you for being a part. Tell your friends to watch Life Today. Turek, along with James and Betty's son, Randy, discuss how believers experience more happiness than those who don't believe in God. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use, unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.